Chapter 61 Early the next morning, right after the buffet, our tour group of brave Englishmen, most of whom were dressed like Indiana Jones, were loaded onto a bus and driven away. When we arrived at the museum, we were caught in a huge line of other tourists even before it opened. There were a lot of different people here Asians, most likely Japanese, always taking pictures of everything, and various Europeans, quietly discussing something, and Russians, judging by the loud, cheerful speech and inappropriately rich and colorific clothes. In general, there was quite a stir. We already had the tickets, so we just waited for the opening, and when our group was approached by our guide, of course, Egyptian, we went inside. The museum itself was a large and beautiful brick color building with just giant arched windows on the first floor. On the grounds around it, among the varied greenery of native plants, we could see monuments and other exhibits, whether a statue or the top piece of some tetrahedral spire. For about half an hour, they took us around the outside area, showing and telling us about this or that exhibit, and only after this walk they took us into the museum itself. The variety of exhibits and rooms was astounding. I do not know how much time I will need to look through all of them, but I doubt that a month will be enough. The largest and heaviest exhibits were on the first floor, whether they were statues, obelisks, various sphinxes, sarcophagus lids, or the like. The most monumental things were on display in the central hall, and the two statues of Tutankhamun's ancestors are seven meters high. According to the guide, they were first brought to the first floor, and only then, around these statues, was the museum itself built. I found another interesting thing. Each exhibit had a magically enchanted plaque next to an ordinary one, hidden from the eyes of ordinary people. It either duplicated information or gave additional information related to magic. The museum also had magic exhibits, and judging by the presence in the halls of invisible people in red and beige uniforms, there were wizards guarding the museum as well. Though the items are magical, they have mostly lost their magical value long ago. For example, a cremation toolkit had a number of special enchantments, underwent special ritual preparation, and more. But, unfortunately, after so many years, the tools have completely lost their properties, and only from the residual traces of magic, it was possible to assume the approximate area of enchantments. The Golden Room, with its gold sarcophagi and other exhibits made of gold, was also impressive. The Hall of Mummies was no less impressive. Interestingly enough, absolutely every exhibit had a magical story to tell. There were descriptions of various charms, traps, and other things that were put on this or that exhibit. But unfortunately, the exhibits had no practical value. The only active artifact was the Mask of Tutankhamun. There is still an unexplored curse active on it, but there are too many conditions to activate it, so there are no special precautions. You can't touch it or do anything else with it anyway, and the special protective charms are so strong that they discourage any ridiculous desires, even from the strongest mages. The excursion was far from complete because you can really walk around for a week if you read a little bit, and for the whole day if you just walk around without stopping. After this event, our whole group got back on the bus and headed for the pyramids. Those three, the most famous ones, Cheops, Chephren, and Menkeren. Of course, there are others, no less famous for those who are interested in this matter in general, the Necropolis of Dasher, Medum, something in Saqqara, I do not remember. But, in Giza, these are the most famous, and very many people associate them with Egypt. The bus took us almost to the very site, to the foot of the Pyramid of Cheops. By the way, there was a small house standing nearby, protected from ordinary people by magic. There were dozens of wizards bustling about and several roads led from the house itself, one of them to a bus stop. I think there's a tour for us, I stressed the last word. Do you want to go now? John asked. I am glad that they are not offended by this division of the worlds. And what about you? We can go together. No. John and Sarah were both indignant at the same time. As I said, I'm not interested in magic. When you go to space, you can call me. John continued, and Sarah nodded accordingly. I see. Shall I go then? Of course. If there's anything really interesting, especially about normal history, be sure to tell me. And don't touch anything. Sure. 
We have a simple rule, don't touch any crap with your hands. That's a good rule. I slowed down a little and stepped behind the bus. With a neat move, I put a muggle repellent spell on myself. Huh, that's funny. I examined myself. And a few hours ago, I was criticizing the British guys for looking like Indiana Jones. Except that I myself am in strange sand-colored breeches, a t-shirt, and a sleeveless shirt, and a hat on my head. A typical British man on a camping trip. There's a special holster on my belt for the wand, but there's also one on my forearm, though with the five runes of aversion burned into it for normal people. Basic stuff, by the way, and almost the first rune model in a textbook from Hogg's Library. Like that, and with a bag on my shoulder, I headed down the road toward the hut. The hut was a decent-sized European-style building of large stone blocks with a very high-quality finish. It was two stories high, and there was no parking for air or other vehicles. It is probably larger on the inside than on the outside. Above the entrance, above the wooden door, was a bilingual inscription, Arabic and English. Three by three pyramids. What is that? Three by three? They're freaking geniuses. They counted the pyramids. Or is there some kind of sacred meaning to it? I'll have to find out. Chapter 62 While I stood there with my arms folded across my chest, scratching my chin thoughtfully, the door to the building opened, and a red-headed guy appeared. Well, not a guy, but already a man. A serious look, hair pulled into a ponytail, wearing leather pants, a shirt, and an English-style robe on top. He's clearly not having fun here, though the dragonskin high boots are out of place with the image created by the rest of his clothes. Oh. He smiled. Now I saw a necklace of small stones with runes on them and a fawn earring in his ear. Who are you, and where are you going? Oh, yes. You may not know English, um. Max. And I speak English perfectly. Bill, he held out his hand to me with a smile. I'm practicing for the goblins here. We shook hands. If you have any questions, you can ask because I have to hurry. I wanted to know, Bill, if there are any excursions for wizards here. Well, of course. He smiled even brighter. Come in and make yourself comfortable, and the tour here is the same as for muggles. It starts at the same time, so in a couple of minutes, there's also a ticket office there if you don't have a ticket yet. And since you're asking, there isn't, right? Right. Well, that's great. I've to go. With these words, Bill stepped away from the entrance, letting me pass, and at a brisk pace headed somewhere. Well, let's go see. The inside of the building was, as I thought, bigger than the outside. After walking through the entrance, I found myself in a large spacious hallway, somewhat reminiscent of Gringotts in London. High ceiling, bright walls, smooth stone floor, with a large geometric pattern, but unlike Gringotts, there were no numerous counters, nor were there any goblins. Instead, along the massive columns were large brown couches and armchairs with a large round table at each. In the corners and near the columns were palm trees and large carved stone pots, and under the ceiling, instead of a chandelier, was a large glass dome, letting in light but not the heat of it. Between each column were two sets of seating and tables, and between them were wooden doors, leading in an unknown direction. At the very end of the hall was only one massive wooden counter, behind which stood a fairly ordinary wizard, a local wizard. There were six other wizards sitting in the room, in two groups, talking about something. There was no question that they were wizards. One group was dressed in classic English robes, except they were shorter and more comfortable obviously for moving in difficult tactical conditions. There was nothing to get caught in such robes, no entanglement in the hem, and so on. The other group looked somewhat exotic and clearly belonged to Asian culture, but which one? The question is uncertain. Both Chinese and Japanese motifs could be guessed in the clothes of the two men and women, but no kimonos, chipao, etc., like hieroglyphics, or I would have known where these travelers were from. Upon reaching the counter, I turned to the man. Hello. I was told that I could sign up for a tour of the pyramids here. You are right, young man. You don't have a ticket? No, I don't. Then you should buy a ticket for five galleons, and you can enjoy a view of the most interesting and dangerous magical manifestations of one of the most ancient artifact structures. I did not listen to him for long, but I simply paid the amount due and immediately received a high-quality ticket with a whole bunch of magical seals, signatures, and stamps. Here, your ticket. The tour will start in. The wizard held up his left hand with a regular, or maybe even a magic clock, and looked at it. In six minutes. You will be in a group with these venerable gentlemen. The wizard pointed to the two groups sitting on couches on opposite sides of the hall. Have a great time. Thank you, sir. I took my ticket and put it in my shoulder bag, 
the same one that looked like my school bag, and sat down by one of the columns and waited. Exactly after the specified time, a man dressed in muggle marching clothes in the color of sandy camouflage entered the hall. The luminescent stripes on his clothes stood out, like on a policeman's. Ladies and gentlemen, the middle-aged wizard spoke softly, but to the entire room. Please come up to me. Both groups, myself included, approached the wizard. Good day to you all. Hello, are the amulet interpreters working? Ja. Hi. Absent, unfortunately. I smiled. Great, our guide smiled back at me and handed me a coin with a hole in the middle and a string through it. Here you go, young man. A spontaneous excursion? You wouldn't believe it. I was just passing by and found this museum. It's a shame to miss it. I agree, said the guide with the same smile, and the other smiled, too. I put the amulet on. Let's check it again. Say something for the young man. How do you do? asked the man from the Europeans. Worth preparing in advance, said the Asian man. Works great, I nodded. Then, the wizard guide pulled a long silver chain from his pocket. Everyone take hold of the chain. This port key will take us to the enchanted entrance, to the Pyramid of Cheops. We all grab the chain. Everybody ready? All right. I will now say the command. Portis. I was spinning all over the place and around the axis. It seemed like the whole world had gone crazy, and I was the only island of tranquility in it. It lasted literally for a brief moment, and I was happy that we weren't all swept around. There is some kind of noise around, but I still felt bad, my head is spinning, everything is floating. Suddenly, my body just froze, and I continued to regain consciousness. After a brief moment, I could see what was happening. Our whole group was standing still, and our guide was standing next to the European man, pointing his wand at his head. Obliviate, he said, and the tip of the wand lit up. In a second, the light went out. Somnus. The guide went like this over everyone, and I was still lying there. Yeah, I could get the paralysis off me. I guess so. But I wondered what would happen next, the man got to me. I'll send you to the customer, the man glanced at his amulet. They're ready to receive you. Too bad, we're not allowed to take trophies. With that, the man pulled out another coin with a hole and a thread through it and exchanged it for the one he had given out before. I'll take the translator, he muttered and pointed his wand at my chest, where the new coin now rested. Dectus Portus Chapter 63 I was in the middle of a vortex that swirled me around and dragged me with wild speed as if it were trying not to transport me, but to tear me apart. All the world around me blurred into solid spinning lines, and after a dozen seconds of such movement, I was literally thrown into a dark room. This time I didn't have to come to my senses it was all clear from the start. I felt my bag, belt, and holster with my wand fly to the side. Then I was lifted and turned upside down, landing on a chair, and the paralysis was removed, but I was securely tied to the chair with thick ropes. What a pleasant meeting, the familiar voice stretched out the words in the same way as before. But all around was darkness. The light slowly flared up, letting me see first the general outline and then the figure of the man sitting across from me. Lucius Malfoy, himself. He was sitting in a chair, in a black suit, playing with a cane in his hands. Sitting there, watching and smirking. Let me be frank with you, Mr. Knight, Lucius was still stretching his words, and I tried to look around the room with my sideways vision, without losing sight of the wizard. I was surprised to receive a letter from my son. There was only a dark room, two chairs in the middle, a door, and a tightly curtained window. There was a simple chandelier on the ceiling with magic lamps it took too long and too pathos to light up. No outlets, nothing like that. To read my son's lines about being defeated in a duel by a mudblood, Lucius grimaced. I was disappointed, and when I read that, um, damned knight stared haughtily at my defeat, I was doubly surprised. How did you manage to survive there? Never mind, though. Lucius brushed his own question aside like an annoying fly. Since you're alive and my old friend hasn't been in touch, I can only assume he's dead. Malfoy leaned forward slightly, placing both feet on the wooden floor. You are either stupid or brave to be so calm. It cost me a great deal of trouble to organize your trip to Egypt, to arrange this tour, and to hire various people with questionable backgrounds. And here you are. So, what's next? What's next? Lucia smiled. I'm going to kill you, Mr. Knight. You were supposed to die anyway, but for some reason, you survived. Three times already. That's a good number, isn't it? It certainly is. But why three? Didn't you figure it out? The first time was when you were a child, after all the rituals, you couldn't survive. But you survived against your fate. The second was the last time we met in France. The third was at Hogwarts, in the Chamber of Secrets. Yes, Mr. Knight, Lucia said, nodding to something in his head, I am aware of those events. To my deepest regret, my greasy-haired friend could not cope with such a simple request. 
As a result, I was once again convinced of an old truth. If you want something done well, do it yourself. Lucius took his wand out of his walking stick in an abrupt motion and came toward me in a lightning motion, lifting my face up by my chin. It's amazing how much you look like her. It's infuriating. Ready to die? Since birth. Well, Lucius raised his wand theatrically, Avada. Abruptly forming bloody blades and slicing through the ropes, I snapped out of my seat in a flash. The small stiletto of blood in my left hand went straight into Lucius' liver, interrupting the spell's reading. He couldn't quite turn around from the painful shock, but he created a tight sphere of protego and reached into his pocket with his left hand. Without wasting a second, I used the spirit weapon in my hand to deliver a single swift and sweeping blow, cutting through his defenses like a knife through butter. Malfoy's head separated from his body, but the body disappeared into the vortex of apparition. But the head was still there, the head miraculously turned toward me as it rolled across the floor, the pain on Malfoy's face, and the disbelief in his rapidly fading gray eyes. The cut wasn't oozing blood it was literally burned from the poison. It took less than a minute for the dead head to melt into the disgusting gurgling liquid, but the bones were intact. That's a murder, and I don't. I don't care at all. Weird? I don't know. I walked around the room and found my things thrown against the wall, so I put back my holster and wand, my belt with all sorts of pockets, hung my bag on my shoulder, took out my wand, and started waving it around. Magica Revelio. It was as if I had a sixth sense, though in my case, it would be more accurate to say seventh sense. There weren't really any charms around various concealing ones, and the like. There weren't even any locks on the door. As I pulled the curtain from the window, I saw the familiar forest. Northern latitudes, maybe even the same England. Pulling the window back up, I turned toward the skull and the liquid beneath it. I thought it would be a little more, epic, I said aloud with some disappointment and some relief and moved toward the door. When I left the room, I found myself in a dark hallway, and I walked toward the light. I walked a little way and came out into a completely empty hall, but there were no curtains on the windows. There was a hallway to the side of the room, and I headed for the front door. I pulled the handle, and the door creaked open. The place was abandoned and overgrown with grass and bushes. When I walked a couple of steps from the entrance and turned around, I saw an old, half-ruined, and blackened by time house in the middle and a couple of others like it in the distance. What a wilderness! Without any wands, I pointed my hand at the house and imagined a complex geometric structure in the palm of my hand. I let the magic flow through it, reciting the key, at the same time. Bod Barfus, a torrent of fire erupted from my hand, like a flamethrower, quickly engulfing the house. No fiend fire, or dark magic, just the larger equivalent of incendio. Quite an interesting fact, there was a lot of magic in that grimoire, without wands, or with other, more powerful concentrators, capable of giving off far more magical power. Wands are cool, too, but perhaps they have less bandwidth? Most of them? It's not for nothing that Potter and Riddle's wand is considered strong, and the Elder Wand is even cooler? According to Ollivander, wands are classified according to their strength. But, never mind. It's time to go. Chapter 64 I wandered through the woods and valleys for about two hours until I came to a normal asphalt road. There was a good chance I was in England, so I took my wand out of my holster and voted. Nothing. Waited a minute, nothing. Maybe I should wait longer. I didn't leave my seat, and as it turned out, for a good reason. After five minutes, a tall purple three-story bus pulled up in front of me, literally out of thin air. It stopped abruptly, and the front doors opened. The night bus shouted a young fellow with light stubble and a disheveled bus conductor's uniform. Hurrying to the rescue of the wizards. He grinned, dashing in goofy. Even if it's in Morgana's backyard, he added more quietly, but I heard him. Hello, I said to the man with a smile. I'd like to go to London. Get in, lad, said the conductor. Twelve sickles. Oh, well. What did you expect, said the man, with an express waving of his hands. We usually shuttle through London and the suburbs, but we're somewhere around. He rubbed his chin thoughtfully, staring up at the ceiling. Somewhere near Sunderland. But that's the other end of the country. Exactly. I unwittingly copied the expressive manner of my interlocutor's speech. I checked my money, which, strange as it may seem, had not gone anywhere. Not many galleons left. For a galleon without a shake? Deal. You heard Ernie, too. Where in London? Let's go to the leaky cauldron. Got it. To the cauldron, Ernie. Sit down, boy. You've got about five seconds left. Heh <laughs> heh. I quickly took my seat and braced myself for some incredibly aggressive driving, but it was a miracle. The night bus drove smoothly and incredibly fast. The picture was blurring. I just wanted to say, Sulu, switch to warp. We got to the leaky cauldron in fifteen minutes, and no shaking. Great. I tossed a coin in my hand and handed it to the conductor. If you find yourself on the edge of the world again, call me. 
The conductor waved at me as I got off. We'll give you a ride. I did not go into the pub, but walked up to Grimmau Place. I looked exotic, to say the least, and I did not cast a spell, because they would register any witchcraft outside of Hogwarts. People looked at me with such interest at times because the sky was cloudy, and it was chilly, and I was Indiana Jones, only in shorts and a hat. It's lovely. But shyness is not about us, and so, with my head held high, I made my way to the house on the Grimald end. I could have just called Creature. Oh, dear. The inertia of thought is a terrible force. I entered the house, and in a completely uncivil manner, dropped my bag in the hallway, and got to the portrait of Walburga. Good evening. Or day, or whatever it is outside the window, I greeted and sat down in my usual place opposite the portrait. It's tea time for five minutes already, the portrait lady said. Creature. A clap sounded at my side. Creature is here, mistress, the old house elf bowed. Make tea and cookies for Maximilian. Right away, ma'am, the house elf bowed again and went to the kitchen with a dejected stride. Maximilian, Walburga, inspected my appearance and made herself comfortable in the chair. And why do I think that you have prepared a rather interesting story? To make a long story short, I went on a trip with my foster parents to Egypt. After visiting the museum, we went to the pyramids, and there I found a tour for wizards. However, when our group picked up the port key, we were transported. Basically where we needed to go, to the entrance, except we were all paralyzed, and the guide took turns putting Obliviate on the wizards and using the intercontinental port key to send me to some house near Sunderland. Lucius was waiting for me there. He wanted to kill me, but he was careless and lost his head. I didn't take the trophy it had dissolved in the acid. Interestingly enough, the rest of the body went somewhere by the port key. While Berga was silent for a few seconds, and then just burst into hysterical laughter. She remained in this state, for at least ten minutes. Frightened by this mistress's behavior, Creature walked around and looked around, bringing me tea and a plate of cookies. Something like this, I summed up as I placed the empty cup on the saucer. Lucius had passed away safely, and now there are fewer threats to my health. By the way, how can I get in touch with the knights in Egypt? I wouldn't want to trouble them. Let's keep it simple. Creature. Another clap came from the side. Creature is here, mistress. The port key to Giza, Egypt. Creature waddled off somewhere, and I stared at the portrait with a question. What are you wondering about? There are many different port keys in the house, including one to Cairo and one to Giza. Egypt has its own counterpart to the night bus, summoned the same way, only the wand must be held vertically. A few sickles will get you where you need to go. Creature here, ma'am, the house elf said, bowing down. In his hands, he held a small iron bar, no larger than a pen. Give it to Maximilian. I accepted the bar. The activator is standard portus. Go ahead, I can see that you're worried. In the meantime, I'll think. Have a good day. I'm a portrait, Maximilian. What could be better? I seem to be perceived a little better. Chapter 65 The journey through Egypt with the knights lasted another week, most of which was spent in Alexandria. This city was quite different from anything I had seen before in Egypt. It was much better maintained, and richer than Cairo, and the people here did not look as clumsy and poor. Maybe, because of the proximity to the Mediterranean Sea? In general, we spent time on the beaches, visited various temples and mosques with interest. However, we did not go inside one should respect others' culture, and visiting a Muslim temple in European tourist clothes is akin to spitting on the religion. Unfortunately for me, I didn't find anything really interesting among the possible magical souvenirs and other merchandise, and the educational material on magic, whether scrolls or books, are firstly in Arabic and secondly for apprentices and wizards with citizenship of the North African Commonwealth of Magical States. It turned out that there was one big magical school in Morocco, for all of North Africa, except that I didn't immediately guess that it was Morocco, because the local wizards call it El Maghreb El Aqsa. And there's also a magical university, where you get some kind of specialty, but what they can teach me I do not understand the language barrier. In general, we returned to England in a good mood, and Knight also got a little tan. I, on the other hand, was still aristocratically pale, and my hair hadn't even burned out. To be honest, I was worried about them turning into the straw, but no, still the same blonde blonde with quite manageable and straight hair. So, while searching for changes in my appearance because of the sudden but unnoticeable climate change, I noticed one interesting thing, I really grew up. Well, I mean, how old am I now? Thirteen? And I'm almost as tall as John, and he's 176 centimeters. He's not tall, but by English standards, he's a medium. I'm a little short. I was expecting six feet, maybe a little more, because I was used to that, but now I was suddenly worried that I might exceed that bar. Was it the potions and the training? Maybe, maybe. On the other hand, if there is no growth spurt, then at this rate, I would grow to the size I wanted. The day after I arrived, I decided to bring up an important point at breakfast. 
So, sitting in the dining room, done with breakfast and just finishing my drinks with my foster family, I spoke. John, Sarah, there's an important conversation. John put the paper down and looked at me carefully, and Sarah nodded her head to let me know that she was participating in the conversation, but that she was not going to be distracted from taking care of her potted flowers. Anyway, here's the thing, you know what I know, what you know. Anyway, it's no secret to anyone here that I'm adopted. Of course it is, and we talked about it a long time ago, John shrugged. Well. I didn't tell you, but I remember something from when I was a baby. The knights looked somewhat interested now. Even Sarah was distracted from the flowers on the windowsill, sitting down at the table. After doing some, so to speak, investigation, I came upon the ancestral home of my birth mother. I didn't know what else to tell. I see you're at a loss, aren't you? Sarah smiled, just tell it like it is. You've shown yourself to be a conscientious young man, for a long time. Christian, our eldest, left home at sixteen, showing his independence. Well, I exhaled, it's quite an old wizarding family, an entire clan, with a history that goes back hundreds of years. The only thing is that it's in very bad shape right now, in the middle of nowhere. There's only one person left alive who can inherit, but is probably incapable. How is that? Oh. Though John incapable of leaving offspring? Most likely, he's now in his twelfth year, in a wizarding prison. Falsely accused. There are three other women, sisters, but the bloodline is old and dates back to ancient, patriarchal times, like tradition. A woman simply cannot inherit there. And besides, one of them is in the same prison, the other is married to a wizard in the first generation. Hmm, what kind of prison is that after which people are incapable of making children? Sarah asked a reasonable question, suspiciously straightening curls of black hair. A magical prison. Not only are there wizards on guard there, but some of the most dangerous magical creatures, whose mere presence has a deleterious effect on the psyche, and they themselves can drink the soul. Literally. What a nightmare. Sarah put her hands to her face, and John frowned. I hope you'll be a law-abiding citizen of magical England, Max. That's not all. They say that in Azkaban, that very prison, even the stones are imbued with horror and misery. And when it comes to magic, drenched in misery must be taken literally. I recently noticed that magic is quite well felt by a kind of sixth sense, it's hard to describe in words. Anyway, it's bad out there. You were talking about the three sisters, Sarah reminded him. Yeah. It's a murky story, and I only know the outcome. The third, the youngest, is my biological mother. However, for some reason, her husband decided that I should be kicked out of his family. She seemed to be against it, but, as I said, it was too murky. Anyway, a couple of rituals, and I'm no longer related to my biological father, genetically, magically, or otherwise. As I recently found out, I should have died after that, but, well, I didn't. It turns out that I am almost a perfect copy of my mother, only a boy. Accordingly, I am the only man capable of inheriting the bloodline. I don't understand, John said with a frown, what reasons are needed to doom your child to death like that. And mother is not better, Sarah grunted. There are many magical ways to impose a will, to make you forget something, and so on. But what I'm saying all this for, I'll be spending a lot of time in my ancestral home in the near future. Hmm, John scratched his chin thoughtfully, and what would joining the inheritance give you? How practical and sensible would it be? Tough question, really. It is a lot of responsibility, coupled with a huge library of magic, a house protected by magic, where many generations of wizards have lived. Believe me, the fact that they lived there makes a big difference. Just as Azkaban is saturated with fear and terror and stuff, this house is saturated with kindred magic. Strange this magic of yours, John smirked. But, you've made up your mind, haven't you? I'm not sure. I'll tell you this, Max, when you get an opportunity in life to achieve something, to get something more than is given to others, you have to seize the opportunity. Doubts because of possible difficulties and failures will only lead to disappointment and many sorrows in the future. It is better to decide to do something than to regret then about the unrealized opportunities and wonder, what would have been if? So you don't mind? Of course, smiled Sarah. You're not the first child in the family. We know very well that sooner or later children leave the parental home, the main thing is to give them a good start. Some sooner, some later. You, Max, are ready to start your own life now. That's weird for us. Sarah put her hand on her husband's shoulder. Weird and unusual, but it doesn't mean we're going to hold you back in any way. Well, I'm not moving out completely, I smiled. Not until I graduate. Still. If the inheritance option might give you more opportunities and prospects, it's worth considering. That attitude couldn't help but make me smile. Frankly speaking, I was afraid that the knights would not like such an idea. Even though I knew them well enough, and they were not strangers, I still had my doubts. But here, everything went quite easily and without conflicts of interest. Chapter 66 
After breakfast, I changed into jeans and a t-shirt, threw my bag over my shoulder, and, taking my jacket just in case, went to the house at Grimald Place. After a chat about the weather with Lady Walburga and a cup of tea, carefully prepared by Critcher, we moved on to more pressing matters. So, Maximilian, said Walburga, taking a few puffs. It's summer, vacation, and I'm curious, what are you planning to do? At all, or in the near future? Both questions. I'm thinking of doing my homework for the summer. Last time I managed to procrastinate until last, which resulted in a mad rush in the last few days of August. That's a pretty reasonable thing to do. However, I'd like to make some adjustments to your plans. I just raised an eyebrow inquiringly, parodying one potion maker. If you're planning on taking a kin, and I dare hope you are, then you should throw your efforts into finding the ring. What is the reason for such a rush? Well, besides your desire to get ahead sooner. Walberga smiled. Finding a head for the house is indeed important, and it would calm the unrest in my old drawn heart, but the reason here is somewhat different. Creature. A clap sounded as usual from my side. Creature has appeared, mistress. The old house elf bowed deeply, as usual, one hand gripping his back. Creature, tell Maximilian what you told me. Creature slowly turned his head toward me as if parodying various monsters from horror movies. The unusual young guest of the noble and most ancient house of black, the house elf said, without a stutter, in a steady but still squeaky voice, has begun to change his magic, old creature can feel it. The house elf began to run his fingers over his hands. The magic is slowly changing, without stopping, creature suddenly turned toward the portrait. Mistress Walburga. The guest looks less and less like Mistress Narcissa. To say I was shocked is nothing to say. How much? Not much at all, the house elf shook his head. Very little, yes. But he's changing. You can go, creature, said Walburga sternly, and the house elf bowed and disappeared. I was pensively silent, and Walburga looked at me, taking one puff after another. I honestly don't care, she spoke, putting her cigarette mouthpiece aside on the table, how you triggered the changes in your magic. The main problem is that if those changes go too far, the ring won't accept you. But, if you get the ring first, then further changes won't matter as long as your magic resembles the reference magic even slightly. My head was spinning with thoughts and obvious guesses as to the reasons for such an interesting change. Is it possible to conjure here? This is the ancestral home of wizards, Maximilian. The possibility of witchcraft here without fear is obvious. I took my wand from the holster on my forearm and immediately waved it. Serpensorsha. The tip of the wand flashed faintly, and a small serpent flew from it. It landed on the floor, looking around in displeasure as it coiled itself into rings. While Berga did not hide her interest in what was happening and even made herself comfortable in her drawn chair. The snake spotted me, tasting the air for a scent with her tongue. Two-legged SS, she hissed, which caused my inexpressible shock. Cancel SSS the spell S. I'll bite you SS. What a twist. I marveled and focused all my attention on the snake. Do you understand me? Parcelmouth SSS, the snake lifted off the ground, looking at me carefully. Fuck it. Viper Evanesco, a colorless blob rushed from the tip of my wand into the snake, burning it out of reality, cancelling the summon. Very curious, Maximilian, while Berka smiled familiarly in the portrait. Like a predator. Does this young man wish to tell the old lady something very interesting? Frankly, I turned to the portrait. Not really, I'm not ready to share such secrets yet. It doesn't sound like it has anything to do with your background. The blacks never crossed paths with Gaunts or any other serpent tongue carriers. So it's an acquired ability. She exchanged her predatory grin for a friendly smile. I look forward, nephew, when you are finally ripe to regale the old lady with an interesting story. Undoubtedly. I have already plunged into my thoughts, reflecting on the far from easy possibilities of my sword. Apparently, somehow, the absorption of the basilisk soul had affected my magic, also adding this interesting ability. I wonder if it's the change in magic or the soul that's affecting it. If the spirit weapon is part of me and absorbed the basilisk soul, then the merger occurred? Another question is if the merging of souls results in a change in body magic, then is magic a purely physiological product, or is it still somehow dependent on the soul? I was reminded of Voldemort's resurrection ritual. He used his father's bone, his enemy's blood, and his servant's flesh. His father was a muggle. Consequently, there was no way he could be genetically either a wizard or a parcel mouth. Nor was Pettigrew a parcel mouth. Potter was a parcel mouth. But if Dumbledore's canonical conclusions are to be believed, the reason for that is the horcrux in his forehead. A horcrux is a fragment of the soul that carries no organics. Consequently, the ability to speak to snakes is transmitted in a spiritual way. Does a horcrux affect Potter's magic? Unknown. There's a reason Voldemort's twin wand fit him. Hmm, it turns out that magic is not a purely physiological product, but also depends on the soul. 
but according to Walburga, my magic until recently was completely equal to Narcissa's. Almost completely. Chapter 67 From what I understand, I can conclude that body, soul, and magic are interrelated. One influences the second, the second influences the third, and the third influences the first. Maybe in some other order, but the influence is unambiguous. Why do I need these deductions and knowledge? I have no idea. Well, then I should really look for the ring, I summed up my thoughts aloud and looked at Lady Walburga. Do you have any ideas or suggestions? None, Walburga shook her head negatively. Even if the ring has any enchantment to find it, I don't know about it. Probably not. There are only two portraits of myself and Lord Phineas Black alive in the house. His portrait, however, is securely locked up by his own volition. At one time, he was headmaster of Hogwarts, so his portrait hangs in the headmaster's office. Portraits of headmasters are enchanted in such a way that they have to answer questions from the current headmaster, and as you understand, he can ask about what's going on in the house, about family, and other things. That's why the portrait is locked so that Phineas Black can't know anything at all about what's going on in the house, and so he can't tell. But why didn't anybody do their portraits? I wondered. It would have been nice and useful to talk to the ancestors. Very few pure-blood old families do ancestor portraits. Now I understand the reasons self-confidence. After all, it's inconceivable that a great lineage could be interrupted or left without an older generation able to impart its wisdom to the young. But, if so, why did you make your portrait, while Berga sighed and was silent for a moment? I was the last of the house, not counting the stupid traitor, Sirius. There was little hope that he would come to his senses, and there was no other heir in sight. Even if he did get out of Azkaban, I'm sure he would go against his own house again, and there would be no children from him. So I made a portrait of myself for two purposes. If an heir suddenly appears, I'll tell him all about the house. Also, to reprimand a wayward son. In case Sirius gets out of Azkaban and shows up here with his insane rude friends, blood traitors, and other ill-mannered rabble, capable only of ruining and denigrating the achievements of the ancestors. At this speech, Walburga proudly lifted her chin. Aristocrat, damn it. Don't look at me like that, Maximilian. A portrait doesn't have many purposes in existence, only that which was invested before it died. You've seen the portraits at Hogwarts, haven't you? Many behave completely out of character with the respectable people they were when they were alive. That's because a lot of them died having already achieved some goals, with no regrets or anything. Many end up doing the nonsense they were thinking about before they died. You know Sir Cadogan? Taha, yes, I saw him. He's funny. Rumor has it that he died quite young, but in his lifetime, he achieved and accomplished everything a knight is supposed to do. Served the crown, fought in the war, saved a princess, and slew the dragon. After a lifetime of training and campaigning, he never really rested or had any real fun. So now he goes from portrait to portrait, pestering everyone with his inept jokes. You mean you had, shushu, while Burgett gestured for me to be silent. Meditate on this in silence. I don't want to wallow in those memories. After that conversation, I went off to do my homework, and I wrote a letter to Hermione, asking if she could remember any way to find a magical object that belonged to a person. I had half of my transfiguration homework done by late afternoon and went to the knight's house. There, after dinner, I sent a letter to Hermione with Pirate. Along the way, I wrote an application to subscribe to the Daily Prophet. I don't know why I had ignored this fascinating newspaper before. The pirate returned an hour later, with two letters. One was on a plain enough notebook page, and the other, as it should be, in an envelope. Hermione wrote that she was not at all surprised. It was my style to write the only letter of the summer, and it wouldn't say anything about, how are you, or anything else. Immediately short and to the point. Well, it's not my fault that I think this way. I don't like to dance around pretending to be interested. I can tell without it that she probably went to France, to Paris. Visited every imaginable site, ran around the entire Louvre, licking her eyes at the Sorbonne in passing. And when she visited the Magic Quarter, she certainly bought various exotic books with exotic charms of dubious practical value. The main thing is that they were beautiful. She likes that sort of thing. Oh yes, and she will definitely bring some examples of French magic fashion with her. That is exactly what I wrote her in my reply letter. Regarding my question, she does not remember any such charms, spells, rituals, and other searching methods. She mentioned various search potions used with special enchantments of the map, but these are methods for finding the living and sentient. In the letter from the Daily Prophet's publisher, there was an approval of the subscription and indicated the delivery time of the newspaper by an L. Other delivery methods can be arranged, up to and including the Muggle mailman, if you wish. Still, they are all more expensive, and by the L is only one canute. A ridiculous price, but it seems to me that the profit is funded by patrons and the ministry. Maybe even just a ministry, and there the benefits of correct information for the masses are obvious to everyone, so the newspaper is available to absolutely anyone.
Chapter 68 I leaned back in my chair and stared up at the overcast sky. It was the middle of July. What to do? Trying to make sense of what I'd learned in the forbidden section was still somewhat useless, even if not in all areas. Potions are not bad, the basis of the literature on which is a variety of recipes halfway through with a history of origin, the potion maker, rare lines explaining the unique reactions and interactions of ingredients difficult to compute from the compatibility tables. It's digestible, yes, albeit not quickly, but it wastes no time, a kind of passive mode. The various charms and spells in the closed literature are very difficult to comprehend and master. Repetition is not a problem. But to understand, change something, control streaming spells like the Fiendfire, no. Not at all. In general, to be more than just an automated wand appendage that casts everyday stupefy and other things according to a ready-made template, I must know the runes and arithmetic. No, not that priority arithmetics and runes. Absolutely everything, without exception, uses these sciences to one degree or another. Arithmetic, as I suppose due to the lack of educational literature for primary and secondary levels, is far from just an analog of mathematics. It takes into account the esoteric meanings of numbers, their numerical combinations, their dependence on the order in which they are arranged, and so on. In addition, I noticed unusual and new signs of operations on numbers, the meaning of which has so far eluded me, as well as abbreviations like cosine, and so on. But this is not the end. This or that numerological formula can have variants of interpretation, depending on the runes assigned in those or other places. That is, if it takes one series of magical manipulation without runes, and point changes in it in some places will lead to one consequence. In the presence of any runes in the beginning, the result is different. By how much? I don't know. In this case, the runes can stand anywhere in the formula, distorting, in the end, the whole spell and the method of its creation beyond recognition. The interesting thing was that apparently, it wasn't enough just to know what changes the runes made to the arithmetic formula. You had to have a clear idea of what the runes meant, their combinations, how they were combined with the numbers, and so on. I found these points out by a trivial comparison of Bombarda and Bombarda Maxima formulas. Just one rune in front of the fourth of five parts of the formula forces you to add one basic gesture, changing the flow of magic into the wand as well. Of course, all this crazy amount of information is not necessary to perform a spell. It is necessary if you are performing the spell for the first time on your own, and imagination, fantasy, and spatial thinking are lacking as a class. When learning magic with a tutor, sometimes a few demonstrations, a very fuzzy idea of the formulas, and finding the right gesture and keyword or phrase for you are enough. This is most likely due to the fact that wizards subconsciously sense magic, its changes, and so forth. Therefore, just by looking, imagining, wishing, and by trial and error, choosing the range of wand sweeps for yourself, the wizard is able to more or less repeat the spell, charms, and so on. So it turns out that my concept of a cool wizard ultimately requires a sea of knowledge and a superbrain to quickly calculate all these data arrays. While I was thinking about it, I remembered the magic in the grimoire. Most of the spells there have a different structure. They are two-dimensional graphical schemes that are a subset of rituals. Again, I have no idea how or why I should visualize such diagrams of such dimensions, and the lines in them should run at such an angle or curve. The only reason I can repeat them is that the visual result of their applications and the feeling of magic when using them, along with the schemes themselves, are permanently imprinted in my memory. So, there's still work to be done. Also, I can clean up the house a little more with magic. Creature just grumbles, wanting to seem super helpful to Walburga, he even cooks by hand and cleans. Everything with his hands. He doesn't even apparate unnecessarily. And I'm a little annoyed by the dust and cobwebs in the hallway, even though they don't look like dirt at all, it looks more like an entourage. Just before August, an owl brought me a magical newspaper. Not the first, and hopefully not the last. On the front page, was a wizarding photo of Sirius Black at the time of the arrest. Insane, scary, crazy-eyed, holding up a license plate and yelling to the camera. After reading the article about the horrible supporter, almost Voldemort's right-hand man, I almost rushed to Privet Drive, but then I thought better of it. Who said he'd be there? How long would I wait there? What should I do when I find him? Where's the guarantee that I won't waste my time? Plus, let's not forget that Potter's house could very well be under much more professional surveillance than just an old granny squib with a horde of magical cats. There are no guarantees, which means the best place to catch him is at Hogwarts, while breaking into our living room. On top of that, I also need to figure out if there's any way to find the ring with magic. It's just, well. If I catch Black, and I ask him, where's the ring, pad foot, and he spits in my face, and says nothing. I don't know legilimency. And if I did, I wouldn't get in the head of a madman. I don't doubt for a second that he's insane. I went to the Black's house almost every day, and there was only one reason, magic. There was a small spell-fortified room where you could cast spells on funny barrel-like dummies on wheels. They could hold a wand, move, and bounce around with simple stupefy of fixed power but high fire density. 
In addition, I noticed that frequent and powerful witchcraft in a house is almost invisible, but improves its energy. It was not for nothing that Walburga had said that the house had absorbed the witchcraft of many generations of blacks. Now, after the stagnation, this very absorption, as well as the consequences of it, are felt, albeit very faintly. I can't tell you exactly what these improvements, sensations, and so on are. I just feel it. Chapter 69 I found some old textbooks in the house that belonged to Bellatrix. At least that's what Creature said. No, I couldn't get anywhere in the house, it's too mothballed, but a house elf could. There were other Black's books here, too, but only hers, in sets and with notes in the margins. If the Potter tale is to be believed, Hogwarts has a Snape textbook full of potions hints. Mostly on potions. So, Bella's textbooks had tons of sketches and hints on spells and enchantments and very little on transfiguration. They started from the third year, and the further, the more sophisticated they were in terms of formulas and the final impact on the target. By the seventh year, there were already only ready-made spells with rare formulas. An already familiar clap came from the front. I put the book down, straightened on the couch, and looked at the creature, who was looking suspiciously sideways. Mistress Walburga wishes to speak to a strange guest, he squeaked, immediately disappearing with the same clap. I went downstairs from my allotted room, to Walburga's portrait. Lady, I nodded, taking a seat in the chair, that was specifically assigned to this corner. Maximilian, she nodded, sitting back in her chair. Time is running out. Creature claims that your magic changes are slowing, but no one can be certain that they will stop. Tell me, Maximilian, have you made up your mind to take the lineage? I think it's a perfectly reasonable move. As long as I don't have to dive too deeply into politics and other things, I'm interested in magic. You don't have to be in politics if you don't want to. Walburga smiled, you don't even have to announce the arrival of Lord Black. Hmm. That's even better. Since you decided to take on this responsibility, we need to do one thing. Since the ring can't be found in the near future, let's at least tie you to the tapestry. How does that help our situation? Very simple, Maximilian. The house, the tapestry, the ring, the various charms it's all interconnected. The house has accepted you, but not completely. There are other elements missing, like runes and a chain. You have already conjured in the house many times, so your magic is here now. Binding to the tapestry will be another link in the chain, and the moment you find the ring, it will not perceive your slowly changing magic as something alien. Lady Walburga. You will forgive my illiteracy in these matters, but what is the ring for? Walburga was obviously going to be indignant, but I hastened to add. I mean a purely applied aspect, not a symbolic one. Hmm, the woman's portrait was quite plodding, and in a second, she didn't want to cause a little scandal. The application aspect, then? I don't even know what to compare it to for a better understanding. It is a key, a seal, and a document. It is a key for everything in the house, to activate and deactivate various charms, artifacts, and the like. A seal is like a personal signature. For example, various contracts for cooperation between houses, firms, banks, and in general, any agreement on behalf of the family is certified by its head, and in our case, the ring. As a result, the holder of the ring is also the holder of the contract. Unless there are additional conditions and personal seals, blood signatures, and other such measures. While Berga decided it was time for her personally to drink her tea, albeit drawn. On the table next to her chair appeared service, and a cup of tea itself quickly organized, on a platter flew into the hands of the lady. A couple of sips and while Berga continued speaking. The role of the ring as a document is somewhat more complex and simpler, at the same time. It has a role in the Wisengamot. Our house is assigned one seat, as it should be, in that dubious gathering. But in order for a new head to take his rightful place among the rest, he must confirm his status. The ministry has a special ancient artifact for this purpose. This artifact fixes the authenticity of the ring and remembers the new owner. This artifact was invented a long time ago when there was neither Wisengamot nor ministry. Still, the Council of Mages existed, but it doesn't matter. The important thing is that without the ring, even if the entire house lines up and swears that a particular person is their head, their place in the Wisengamot will remain empty. Is that all? What did you expect? There's nothing much to it, but it will be extremely difficult to regain full control of the house without the ring. There will be no access to any ancestral contract or agreement, nor will the family vault be able to be opened. Family vault? Don't even think about it, dear nephew, while Berga spoke with a smile. There aren't mountains of gold in there. Almost all the money is in circulation, and all the income goes into circulation. Money is the only thing you can trust to goblins, and be sure it won't go to waste. The main thing is the right contract. I see. In that case, it would really be best to make this binding. Creature. The usual clap from the side and the customary bent over the portrait house elf once again spoke of himself in the third person. Creature. We need to do binding of Maximilian to the tapestry. 
Mistress has decided to welcome a strange guest into the family, wondered Creecher, but immediately bowed again. Critter will make all the arrangements. This time he did not disappear, but walked on foot, muttering something to himself and rubbing his hands. What's Creecher for? The binding has to be done by someone who is already related to the house, or is a conductor of magic. How many different restrictions? I whistled. What if there is no one left at all? Walberg aside. Then either the house will be completely extinct, or the found blood heir will have to break everything down and build again. But, to untangle the spells, twisted by many generations of ancestors, you will have to spend a lot of time and have a huge baggage of knowledge. And, perhaps, not to be deprived of talent. After so many years, all these charms can hardly be considered something separate anymore. In the sense of? If you want to study such things, you should delve into the wilds of artifacting. It's an extremely complicated facet of magical art, but you can keep it short. Let's take a broomstick as an example. It uses a wide variety of spells to create it flight, control, comfort. These are complex, multi-component enchantments. Over time, if they are not etched with runes, it is as if the enchantments merge, ceasing to be separate enchantments. It becomes a powerful single complex. For this reason, old brooms are not recommended for use, nor do they require constant prophylaxis. If a new broom loses a few twigs, nothing happens, but if it's old, who knows what effect a torn piece of magic will have on the broom. How ambiguous things are. Chapter 70 After ten minutes of waiting, the house elf returned. All is ready, mistress, creature wheezed from around the corner, coming out at the same time, holding a dagger of some kind in his hands. Go with creature, Maximilian. While Berga smoked a cigarette and stared somewhere behind the portrait's frame, making it clear that the conversation is over. I nodded and got up from my chair, and followed creature down the hall. The house elf led me to a spacious, empty hall, one of whose walls was an old and shabby canvas, with gold embroidery, it's holding on with the last bit of strength. Creature spoke softly, gazing up at the cloth in awe. On the tapestry of the family, it was on it that there were the names of the wizards of this family, of many generations of wizards. On a quick but careful look around, I noticed a couple of scorched spots. Two of them belonged to wizards of the past generation. The big escaping hole was on the side of Regulus Black, and the second, precise and neat, not even a trace of scorch marks, was between Bellatrix and Narcissa Black. Quite rare wizard names have been connected by lines of golden embroidery to wizards of other houses a marriage bond. An even smaller number of such connections spawned a small golden line to a common child. Here, for example, is Draco Malfoy. Creature, Lady Walburga told me that wizards don't exchange information like that, I pointed my hand at the lines of mating ties. A sign of trust, Creature squeaked. Give me your hand, strange guest. The house elf extended his skinny, gray, bony hand toward me. I leaned a little and put my hand in his. I need some blood. With these words, creature gently and quickly pricked my palm, making some blood protrude on it. The strange guest of the most ancient and noblest house black should put his palm to the tapestry. Where exactly? It doesn't matter. I put my hand in the first place I saw. Creature did the same, muttering something so quiet that I couldn't make out a single word. There was an almost imperceptible surge of magic in my hand, and my name appeared next to the Black Sisters. Except it was Maximilian Night Black. And there were no lines. Creatures finished, the house elf hissed, removing his hand from the tapestry. I followed his example. After the binding, I hurried to Walburga's portrait. Lady Walburga, we are finished. She merely nodded. I have a question. I appeared on the tapestry next to Narcissa, Bellatrix, and Andromeda, but there is no parental bond. I assumed a similar thing. The tapestry thought you were Narcissa's brother, but the lack of connection could be for several reasons. Anyway, you are Narcissa's son, as I see it, and as I understand from your story, you are more suited to brother status. Plus you're changing magic. The tapestry easily identified your place, generation, so to speak. But where you come from, dear nephew, the tapestry cannot understand. After all, it's just a complexly enchanted canvas, you shouldn't expect much. I see. That's about what I thought, but the second question is much more interesting. Why is my last name Night Black? Yes? How interesting, while Berga perked up a little. How long have you known about your lineage? A long time. Hmm, and did you know that Narcissa was a maiden black? Yes. And you didn't think to deny such a connection? No, and it was even kind of interesting. Are you saying that this surname is not foreign to me? If we consider the past conversation about the connection to the name. Exactly. And it's quite interesting. Perhaps even some time black will come first, while Berga allowed herself a moment's weakness, and her face took on a dreamy expression. But then why did the letter from Hogwarts come as nights after all? The little wizard's registration occurs at the moment of the first magical outburst. I'm sure you weren't even thinking about kinship yet at that point, so the last name black wasn't anything special to you personally. It's kind of confusing. 
Certainly, the magic of names and souls is a great unsolved mystery, as are the mechanisms by which it works. For more than a hundred years, wizards have been battling the question. However, Lady Walburga, I would like to hide the fact that I am black. We don't need any unnecessary attention right now. I fully support you, nephew, Walburga nodded. Just touch the tapestry with your wand and wish to conceal this information. It's an opportunity you have as the future head. What about official documents if I suddenly have to sign them? Just don't sign anything yet. Not even a bloody feather can get your full name out of you, though. It's not an option at all. Nor will Veritasarum force you to give your full name. I hope that's true. Well. I sighed, smoothing the missing creases of my thin black turtleneck with my hands. I think I need to take a little walk. Sure, but before the walk, I hid black on the tapestry. Tried to hide myself completely, but it was a complete fiasco. I so wanted to say, you don't have enough rights to perform this operation. Chapter 71 At the beginning of August, I received a letter from Hogwarts with a list of textbooks, both basic and supplementary. I had decided to go to the Diagon Alley and buy the required books and other school stuff. Still, Lady Walburga insisted that I go to at least some little atelier. I need magic clothes. It goes without saying that the Grimmaud house had piles of clothes, both worn and brand new, mothballed. Despite Lady Walburga's demand, however, she was in no hurry to have creatures supply me with clothes. The reason for this was insanely simple, everyone who needed it had already realized the suspicious resemblance of my face to Narcissus. At the same time, again, everyone knows that I grew up among muggles, and for public opinion, there is still the possibility that I am a muggle-born. And then, lo and behold, wearing magical clothes made of equally magical fabrics and obviously with cool charms on them. And the style is old, and young witches know a thing or two about it. And where, may I ask, has a muggle-born wizard, bearing a suspicious resemblance to a public man's wife, suddenly acquired new wizardly clothes of an old style and cut? Lady Walburga. I pretended to be indignant as I stood in front of the portrait. I love and appreciate suits, doubles, triples, double-breasted, single-breasted, with or without a stand-up collar. I don't care, even if it's an overcoat. But it's too uncomfortable for everyday wear. Do not talk nonsense, nephew, waved off Walburga and was about to start some speech, as if her face changed, as if visited the lady insights. You wore magic clothes? Not enchanted, but made of magic fabrics? Just robes, I see. Here is the reason for the prejudice. Now, young man, show some confidence in an elder's opinion and go to the atelier. Creature will give you the money. Creature. Money. A clap and a house elf appeared at my side and held out a leather purse. Creature brought the money, ma'am, young lord, the house elf nodded, almost rendering me speechless. He nodded to me. A lord, too. On the other hand, not a vile family traitor, and thanks, Merlin. Anyway, I had to go. No, I was not against trying on and evaluating the magic version of business suits or something similar because I had always liked this style of clothing. The problem was that such clothes often limited the freedom of movement and maneuvering and were not known for their comfort. However, after spending almost two hours in the same store of Madame Malkin, which was called robes for all occasions, I managed to get quite a decent black three-piece suit with a double-breasted jacket. The style and fit were a little old by the standards of the ordinary world. Still, the fabrics were quality and comfortable, and, combined with the enchantment, I had the impression that I was wearing the most comfortable clothes there could be. Of course, the custom tailoring was also worth considering. I understood Lockhart in his books for a moment, he seemed to be in permanent shock at the convenience and possibilities of magical clothing, which did not affect my appearance at all. That's why a third of his books were devoted to such subtleties and details of his personal closet. The rest of the shopping for school did not take much time, although I sometimes had to wade through the crowds of familiar and unfamiliar wizards, who rushed with excitement and even some frenzy for shopping, once they received the Hogwarts mailing list. That's why there was no shortage of people on Diagon Alley. I saw the plus side of that as an opportunity to listen in on the conversations. But it was mostly about Black, his danger, the fears of the other wizards, and so on, so I didn't stick around long enough and quickly headed home. I spent the entire month of August at nights in Grimald Place. At nights, I repeated the usual school program, going far, far ahead, so that the usual homework in Hog would not be time-consuming. It turned out that even though thanks to a clemency, my memory is quite good, but the events of the distant past, whether infancy or past life, remain of the same quality for me. At Grimald Place, the situation was slowly improving, I mean, slowly and surely, the look of the house's general abandonment was disappearing. If I solved the basic and obvious problems by removing the dust, soot, dirt, magical pests, doxies, and other things that hid there, then it seemed that Creature did the rest. In addition to making the house look at least somewhat decent, I conjured and studied a couple of books on a clemency so as not to make irreparable mistakes in my mental experiments and developments. 
The outcome of the study was that the information was too abstract, too individual, and that what worked for one person would not work at all with another. Due to the absence of any specific techniques, my consciousness and cube project has been suspended for an indefinite period of time. I did not give up my physical training either, and I did not need any simulators for that transfiguration, though it was a bit difficult without the necessary formulas. I tried to study Patronus, it didn't work, though I had the right literature. As I thought, to learn such complex spells, not without reason related to higher magic, requires either a mentor or extensive knowledge, experience, and skills. I had nowhere to find a mentor, and the rest I was still just working on. I work hard, diligently, all the time, but not enough to learn the really hard stuff on my own. Even the books recommended by McGonagall and Flittick, safely memorized, which I began to master, could not help. Eh, I wish someone had shown me Patronus a couple of times. And gave me a happy memory, I don't have any of those. Seriously. No matter how hard I tried, nothing came to mind. Chapter 72 on September 1st, as a decent young man should, I loaded my frail body into the Hogwarts Express carriage at the appointed time. I said goodbye to Walburga and Critcher, and I didn't forget about the knights, how could I? I had done my homework, studied the subjects for six months ahead of time, and everything was ready. With those thoughts in mind, I went into the first compartment I saw. On the seat, leaning against the window, and covered with his own coat, a man was sleeping. His face was covered by a hat pulled forward, and on a large trunk next to him was a small sign that said Professor R.J. Lupin. No, I'm not sitting here. Closing the door, I went on my way. There was quite a bit of time before departure, and the wizards hadn't yet piled onto the nine and three-quarter platform. I checked the empty compartment and made sure it was empty, so I settled in, looking at the wizards scurrying in and out. At one point, a familiar curly head flashed through the crowd. The girl, dressed as usual in her school uniform and carrying a bag similar to mine instead of a trunk, was busily examining the wizards, standing a little away from the carriage. I opened the window and waved my hand, attracting her attention. Hermione immediately smiled and waved back, quickly heading into the carriage, and within seconds she was in the compartment. Max, she rushed happily into a hug, staying true to her habit. Well, as always, she got a symmetrical response in the form of no less bone-crushing hug. Hi, Fluffy. I got a fist to the liver area as soon as I said it. Hermione pulled away with a slight smile and pointed a finger defiantly at her hair. Look, I have straight hair. Her hair was indeed well-groomed, not unlike her first year. Fluffy once, fluffy forever. At least a couple times a year. Now, what happened? Everything was good last year, the girl, though we could start calling her lady, sat down across from me with a smile, letting me sit too. Tell me. Tell you what? Everything. Um, two times two is four. Max, you're such a baby, honestly. Hermione rolled her eyes to the ceiling. How was your summer? Studying Egypt, the pyramids, magic, books, homework, physical training, very, short. Better let me tell you. Like you said in that letter, I was in France with my parents, in Paris. My assumption about Hermione's trip was fully confirmed, except for the fact that she visited more places than I would have thought possible. Almost every institution in Paris that had any cultural, intellectual, or magical value had been, if not explored, at least visited. With the pounding of wheels and occasional brief visits from students familiar from Hogwarts, the conversation turned to homework, notes and essays were read, checked, and some of them even supplemented. Before we knew it, the weather began to deteriorate noticeably. Now it was already pouring outside the window in heavy rain and dusk. I began to prepare myself morally, just in case. It was a non-trivial task to drive away the high-class undead, both material and immaterial creatures, whose magic works directly with the soul and mind. In general, these creatures are quite unique and extremely rare in nature. If you believe the literature, it turns out that there are places of their accumulation only in England and distant South America. Here it is, Azkaban, the creation of a dark hermit wizard. In South America, it is an ancient pyramid, guarded and deeply buried in the jungle. But if in America it's a shelter for ten dementors, a sort of magic sanctuary, where the number of these creatures is regulated for some unknown purpose, in England it's a prison. But that's all lyricism the train was beginning to stop. It was still forty minutes before Hogsmeade. It was getting colder on the train, and the windows were starting to get a thin crust of ice. Steam was coming out of my mouth as if it were winter, it became uncomfortable, and some incomprehensible and ungrounded lump of fear floated up from the depths of my consciousness. It was a shapeless lump with nothing concrete in it, just animal fear. Strange. Hermione whispered, rubbing her hands together. Realizing the futility of such a thing, she took out her wand and began casting warming spells. It was no use. The light went out. Now I took my wand out of its holster and pointed it at the door, mentally arranging the seal's geometric structure on the tip of my wand. I can't create a Patronus, but there's a less effective spell in the grimoire. 
If the Dementors aren't really aggressive, they'll leave, no one likes discomfort. Fiend fire and other magic of the total destruction type would take them, too. But, again, that's not for me. The silence in the wagon began to change to ear-piercing shrieks, a kind of panic that passed in an instant. There were quiet and pitiful sounds of crying. Give Lumos, I turned to the girl, and she immediately complied with the request. The light was faint and wavered a little, like the flame of a candle in the wind. The compartment's door opened, and immediately a desiccated black and gray hand rested on top of it. A moment and a fuzzy silhouette in a fluttering black hood could be seen floating down the corridor as if it were underwater. Beneath the silhouette's hood, the darkness was pitch black. Dementor looked into the compartment. It had moved, as if it were looking around, but not finding its target, the creature moved away, and, absurdly, closed the door behind it. Pale Hermione stared at the closed door, her jaw almost clenched shut, and her wand hand trembled faintly. A couple more shrieks nearby, and a sharp bluish flash of viscous flare swept through the carriage. A few hurt and angry noises were now added to the cacophony of silent sounds, but it made me feel better. What was that? A trembling Hermione asked quietly, and I, throwing off the incomprehensible stupor of formless fear, reached into my bag. Here, I handed the girl a chocolate bar. Eat it. It'll make you feel better. It's Dementors. Dementors? Hermione quickly got over her shivering, but she was still as pale and depressed as ever. The acclimacy was clearly helping, but... What is it like, for people in Azkaban? Yes, guards of Azkaban. Eat a candy bar, it really helps. Where did the chocolate bar come from? Hermione quickly began crunching on the hard bar, simply ripping the packaging. I took one for myself. Sirius Black escaped from Azkaban. I had some suspicions that our valiant ministry would send the Dementors to Hogwarts. What nonsense. Reality. The recent incident had taken its toll. The lights are still out, Hermione's Lumos is stable, but not bright, so it doesn't blind my eyes, so I myself did not notice how I sent two stupefy into the sharply opened compartment door. Silently. And Hermione instantly let go of the chocolate bar, running her fingers over the wand and creating a protego. Now the Lumos burned on her free hand, a quality film of the shield in front of us and the entrance, and a male face with a pair of thin scars was looking at us from the aisle. A commendable reaction, gentlemen, he said with a smile and concern, glancing quickly around the compartment. It was obvious that the man had dodged one stupefy, by deflecting slightly, and had taken another ride on the wand. Eat some chocolate. That'll help. I won't bother you again. The compartment door closed. Who's that? R.J. Lupin. Professor, I replied. Probably in Dada. Did you see the defense? Yeah. We put our wands away, and the wagon finally got its lights back on. Hermione was hypnotizing a chocolate bar, lying on the floor with an unspeakable expression on her face. I broke off a piece of mine and shared. Thanks. You're welcome. I hope Professor Lupin turns out to be a worthy teacher. Probably. What makes you think that? Well, Dumbledore should appoint someone adequate for once. Just for a diversity. Well, only if for a diversity. The train started, and forty minutes later, we were on the platform. The guys around us were still in a state of shock, pale and frightened, looking around every now and then. It had stopped raining pretty hard on the way to Hogsmeade, but there was no less mud and puddles. Carriages and festivals again, but now there was a novelty, a thorough inspection, by the professors and someone from the ministry. They conjured up things and people and let them through to the gates in front of the castle one by one. Somehow we ended up joining Griffinder's general flow, greeting everyone and discussing the absurdity of Black's attempts to get into Hogwarts. I answered some of them, agreed with some of them, denied some of them, and my head was spinning and crumbling with plans and theories as to how I could catch this dog and shake him down to find out where he'd put the ring. Chapter 73 I stared at the canopy of the bed in a kind of prostration as I struggled to open my eyes. The morning had begun, suspiciously hard. Who was to blame, and what to do? There was only one logical explanation, the Dementors. Their presence nearby puts a tangible strain on the mind. On the one hand, they're far away, but on the other, they're out in the open, and if they're not lurking in the forbidden forest, scavenging for food among the local animals who must have emotions and souls, they can be seen floating in the air above the treetops. It's a depressing picture. All this fuss with the Dementors can take a tangible toll on physical fitness. I used to go jogging in the morning before the cold weather. Now, apparently, I would have to use the moving stairs in the main tower of Hogwarts. But there was nothing wrong with that it was good exercise, too. After I finished my jog, a little sweaty and out of breath, I cleaned myself up in the shower, and only after that, I put on my suit and robe and went down to the living room. Before I went to bed last night, I checked with Percy about the uniform. It turned out that in classes, there had to be this uniform or a strict costume. There are even amendments for those who have traditions, national or some other, that don't allow them to wear such clothes. 
Such students are allowed to dress in business clothes appropriate to their traditions, but the robe over it is mandatory. If my uniform implies at least the theoretical possibility of wearing a tie, it is mandatory. If my shirt is white, the rest is extremely preferable in black or dark gray. Why didn't I take an interest in these nuances before? From the men's wing slowly and surely began to appear sleepy students from different years, dejectedly rubbing their hands over their eyes and cheeks, or just walking around sluggishly, trying to correct the ridiculously protruding edges of shirts and loose hanging ties. I sat in our inconspicuous corner and quietly read one of the books on the ancient runes. Generally, on this subject, I would have to go to the library and get a bunch of different interpreters, dictionaries, translators, and other reference literature, but now I was reading something general. Even the title is common. Ancient Runes of the Peoples of England and Western Europe. Classification and Description. A little later, the girls began to descend into the living room. They, unlike the male half of the faculty, looked much more lively and tidy. Percy came into the living room, tidy as ever, with his cap on, and in general, a model student. Also, I think, he was according to the badge on his chest, the school's prefect. Percy was immediately active, pointing to the bulletin board, handing out schedules, assigning various people in charge, and gathering the little ones into a pile at the same time. Hi, Hermione plopped down on the couch next to me. Did you get the schedule? Hi, not yet, I nodded toward the fidgeting red-headed prefect. Then let's see, Hermione put her bag on her lap and quickly found the scroll there. We have the same extra lessons, don't we? If you didn't get something else, they're the same. No, ancient runes, and arithmancy. Numerology. The lesson is called arithmancy, which means it is correct to call it that way. You'd better show the schedule since you've got it. Here, Hermione showed her scroll. First we have runes, then transfiguration, and then. The conversation was distracted by an incomprehensible noise and a bright explosion. The Weasley twins burst out of the men's wing. One had ears that were almost as long and hanging down to his chest, and the other had a nose. It didn't look good, but these jerks, after examining themselves, began to cheer. The rest of the Griffinders picked up on the laughter, amusing themselves and the others. Nice, Hermione muttered, squirming slightly in a completely opposite emotion to that word. Let's go to breakfast already. The Great Hall of Hogwarts was abuzz with whispers and conversations that kept coming up with the word, Dementors. Everybody has been scared by their encounter on the train, many of them frightened and pale. Some of them showed distinctive black eyes from sleeplessness. I glanced fleetingly at the Slytherin table. Malfoy was present. He was discussing something. Malfoy smiled a couple of times wryly, but looked lost. However, no one seemed to be paying attention to that fact. Politeness, inattention, or lack of awareness of recent events? As far as I know, Lucius's death was not advertised anywhere. I wonder if there's a reason for that. Chapter 74 The study on the seventh floor, dedicated to the subject of ancient runes, looked rather interesting and unusual. It reminded me of an old memory from a previous life when I was five or six years old, when my parents had sent me to study English. In that classroom, all the walls were covered with various posters, charts, pictures, and other things, but every word and letter, absolutely every single one, was in a language I did not know. It would seem that the letters were similar, but they formed some incredible nonsense, and the lessons themselves were held on the principle of total immersion, not a word in Russian. That was stressful. Now I experienced a strong sense of nostalgia, looking at the various pictures and posters along the walls, tables, and shelves with objects marked with runic inscriptions. And I couldn't understand a word of it. Well, almost. The meaning of a couple of runes, an approximate translation of others, I knew. This knowledge provoked a burst of nostalgia, like the characters are familiar, but do not understand a word. At the teacher's desk sat a respectable-looking lady, of indeterminate age, but not young. Her black hair was pulled back in the manner of Legolas, but with straight bangs, neat glasses, and a dark maroon robe, as if made of silk. Hello, we said at the same time as Hermione, looking around at the students. There weren't many. I would even say very few. A blonde girl from Slytherin, a curly-haired boy from Ravenclaw, Goldstein, if I'm not mistaken. That's it. Not a single person from the Hufflepuff. Very curious. Oh, more students, the teacher allowed herself a slight smile as she looked up from some scrolls. Have a seat. We'll begin shortly. We walked forward and sat at the first desk in the middle row. On the right was the blonde. Greengrass, right. I'd forgotten she even existed. She was sitting upright, like a proper student, with her hands on her desk, her textbook, and a couple of scrolls beside her. In the row to our left sat Goldstein, no less studiously posing as a monument to an excellent student. After laying out everything we had for the lesson, we wasted no time. Hermione pulled out a small book and began to read it with great interest, while I continued to work on the mind in a cube project, taking notes in a small notebook. With the most ordinary pen. 
We had very few students who used pens and notebooks for personal note-taking, all with quills. Okay, students, our teacher stood up from her desk, and the door to the office closed. Let's not waste time and wait for class to start. No one else should come anyway. The teacher came out to us, standing in front of the middle row. First of all, since there are so few of us, I suggest we do a little reshuffle. With a slight movement of her wand, the first desks of the neighboring rows slowly and carefully moved in close to us. Greengrass only arched an eyebrow in perfect imitation of Snape, and Goldstein didn't care at all, he was expecting a lesson. I have no desire at all to run between the four of you all over the room. I hope there's nothing wrong with that? No? That's great. Let's get acquainted. My name is Besheda Babbling. I hold the title of Master of Renology in Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon Studies. Yes? Professor Babbling looked at Goldstein's raised hand. Professor, but... Are they different profiles? I mean, they're the same. You're not quite right, Mr. Goldstein. Anthony Goldstein, ma'am. Mr. Goldstein. The most ancient are considered to be the so-called Proto-Scandinavian runes. As time went on, ancient peoples migrated, conquered new territories, and their language changed and improved. As a result, over time, the same at first glance runes have different meanings, supplemented, or no longer used. However, really, if you take the same runes in different alphabets, we will get almost identical magical impact, but possibly different meanings. Suppose the runes will be used for direct application to an object, etching, embroidery, or in any other way. In that case, the difference in the alphabet is of minimal importance, which can be neglected. However, if the runes are used in a magical formula for a spell, in a text, in recipes, and so forth, where it is not the magical effect, but the meaning that is important, then you understand yourself, the difference can be not just noticeable, but incredibly huge. I see. Thank you, Professor. So. Let's develop a curriculum for the first semester. To that end, now we're going to talk a little bit about what you know about the runes, and how you see them in your life. We found out that no one really knew anything about the runes, and that we'd signed up for these classes for very different reasons. I and Hermione, for the complicated spell formulas, and Goldstein, for the creepy interest. Greengrass, because she couldn't learn it normally at home, unlike the rest of the subjects, the second lesson was more practical. We studied the very basics from the very beginning. The Elder Futhark, on the basis of this ancient runic alphabet, later developed the rest, with their magical meaning and interpretation, various sacred meanings. Junior runes we will also go through, but out of them, even a third does not have real magical meaning, and therefore are only suitable for writing. The first rune is Fehu. We wrote down a whole bunch of different versions of its magical interpretation and single use. When applied to the surface, the main purpose of it is to defocus directed magical energy in all directions. And the energy doesn't get any weaker because of that. A simple rune chain, Protective Cross, was used as an example. In it, Fehu is the center, and around it are four unfamiliar runes. The effect of the cross, when applied to a surface and activated by a portion of magic, is that the object is protected from negative, destructive effects. The limit of protection is the invested power multiplied by four. Will not protect against total destruction, class magic, such as fiend fire and mental directions. Without the rune, Fehu protective cross can be made to work, but then you would have to combine the four remaining in a closed system, and the ratio of protection and infused magic will be one to one. In addition, there was a sea of other information about the Fehu rune, including the possible magical interpretations when turning the runes at different right angles. With ink and pen, we were entrusted to enchant a wooden cube. The runes were carefully and meticulously applied. It took a long time. It wasn't right the first time, small mistakes negated the protection factors of the cubes, but anyway, it was fun to see how Professor Babbling's Blu-ray of Reducto either absorbed the cube with a little glow or destroyed it. Such protection seemed effective, but then Professor Babbling reminded us that the magical capacity of a rune depended on the material and that Reducto was as weak as it could be. That was the end of the lesson. Chapter 75 I'm really curious, Hermione said, as we walked down the corridors of the castle, to our next class. I wonder why the Hogwarts library doesn't have such detailed information. Maybe there is. After all, that's where we need to get four whole books on the subject. And why would there be such information where we used to read books? It's basic knowledge. You're right there, she nodded. By the way, I'll have to stop by the headmaster's office today. Just like that, to the headmaster, like the neighbors for tea? Hermione looked at me with a slight sneer in her eyes. Exactly for a tea. I'm sure the headmaster will give me a cup and some sherbet lemon for the road. Or he'll give you some detentions. For insolence. One doesn't preclude the other, I shrugged, turning the corner. There's the transfiguration room. And the people inside are settling in. We quickly made our way to the first desk in our Gryffindor row of Silly House feud. 
McGonagall was sitting at the lecture table, taking notes in a scroll. Here, it seems, professors always were, and the head of the house even more. Second, to second with the bell, the professor stood up, waved her wand, and the door to the office closed. Another boring lecture began in dry academic language, a bunch of formulas, and at the end, there would probably be another exercise. But how to do it properly, she would tell us tomorrow. Or when is the next class? I wasn't quite right, though. McGonagall had decided to agitate those who were at least a little interested in the subject and maintain that interest, and maybe even ignite it more than before, she told us about animagi. She told us that animagi can be divided into two kinds, totem animagi and anima form animagi. A totem animagus is a wizard who can transform into only one animal, which is his totem, a kind of inner beast. There are several ways to achieve such a skill, and they all involve certain risks, especially mental ones. Anima form is a wizard capable of transforming into several animals. This is a very long and thorny path that requires not only extensive knowledge, but also patience. However, once the final result is achieved, the wizard will not be limited to it at all, you can develop further and learn to transform into other animals. Professor McGonagall is just such a wizard. Although her totem is a cat, just like the anima form, she achieved it in the second way. In addition to the ways of attainment, the two types of animagus differ in their perception of the world in animal form. Totem animagus adopt some of the habits of their totem, while the anima form's mind remains completely free of such changes and influences. But the totem animagus has more protection against various mental techniques, unlike the anima form. However, if the totem animagus goes crazy, then it will be almost impossible to stop this landslide. For a clear demonstration, the professor turned into a smoky gray cat with neat circles under her eyes, jumping up on the table at the same time. She looked around the classroom, but no one seemed to care, it was more interesting to peek at Potter surreptitiously. A lot of people were doing that the whole class. McGonagall turned back. What's the matter with all of you today, she asked, looking at everyone, with surprise, over her glasses. It's not important, of course, but it's never happened before that turning into a cat and back didn't draw applause. There, almost the entire class stared at Potter again, as if on command. Pale, confused, and seemingly even a little angry. We had a divination class, Seamus said lightly. So. Oh, that's it. That makes sense then, McGonagall frowned. You don't have to say anything else, Mr. Finnegan. So who has to die this year? Hermione looked around the classroom with interest, saw the looks directed at Potter, and whispered, And why am I not surprised? The others were silent, and so the professor heard. Miss Granger, she looked at Hermione. I wasn't there, professor. I have other subjects. Indeed, McGonagall nodded. So? It's me, Potter squeezed out. Well, McGonagall glared sternly at the one who deprived the dean of the well-deserved applause she no doubt snatches from third years every year. So know this, Potter, the professor went on, the Sybil Trelawney has been predicting the imminent death of one of the students every year since the first day she entered the school, no one, however, has died so far. She begins her introduction to the class, with omens of death. She's very fond of it. I never speak ill of my colleagues. The professor was silent and so focused on something that she went a little pale. Divination is the most imprecise branch of magical knowledge. I won't hide it from you, I don't tolerate it enough. True seers are extremely rare, and Professor Trelawney dash. McGonagall was silent again, but soon spoke again in her usual businesslike tone. You look great, Mr. Potter, so don't be offended if I don't relieve you of your homework. But rest assured, you don't have to do it if you die. Interesting offer, I muttered quietly to myself, while the rest of the class giggled. That is all for today. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this journey, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell. If you have any suggestions or feedback for me, please drop a comment down below.